All right, this is the July 18th meeting of the Weber to see working group. We have two hours together. We abide by the W3C patent policy, which is described at this link, and only people companies listed at the link are allowed to make substantive contributions. So at this meeting, we're going to cover extended use cases at metadata, ICE controller, and code transform, device ID, and permissions. And we have a bunch of future meetings, uh, including meetings at TPAC uh, that are coming up. So uh, a little bit about this meeting. We have a link to the slides on the wiki. We do need to get a volunteer for note taking. And the meeting is being recorded. The recording will be public. We have a volunteer note taker. I guess Dom isn't here today, today, right? No, he's not. Yeah, so I'm just wondering who we have to take notes. Any volunteers? I can start. OK, thank you, Harold. All right. OK, so a little bit about the code of conduct. We operate under the W3C Code of Ethics and Professional Conduct. So let's try to keep the conversations cordial and professional. A few things about the meetings. You probably already know this. It's recorded. You can raise your hand to get into the speaker queue and lower your hand to get out of it and call on you. And please wait for the microphone access to be granted. Uh, if you jump the queue, we'll mute you. And if you can use a uh, heads, headset or a uh, echo cancel speaker. All right. Just a little bit of the document status, because uh, because something's in the W3C repo doesn't mean it's been adopted. And we use the call for adoption process to determine that. Um, editors drafts don't represent consensus, but working group drafts do. And sometimes we merge PRs that lack consensus, but we attach a note. And we have, we'll have some examples of that uh, later today with the use case. OK, so here's the agenda for the meeting. We're going to do extended use cases. Then we'll have Palak do set metadata. Uh, UN will talk about encoder transform. We have Samir and Peter with ICE controller. And then Yana Ibar will do device ID and permission score. For that today. All right, so we'll start off with the extended use cases. So as we talked about in May, uh, there's a number of things we're trying to do to upgrade the, we call it the WebRTC extended use cases document now. And one of them is to figure out requirements that we did CFCs on, but uh, got comments, but haven't yet uh, resolved the comments. So. We're going to focus on, in particular, the low latency streaming use cases in section 3.2 today. Um, we had a CFC that concluded on January 16th, and we got six responses received, fiber and support, one no opinion. So there was consensus in general for the use cases, but there were questions about it um, that we haven't resolved yet. So that includes open issue 103, which UN filed, and we'll be talking a lot about that, um, and also an open issue 94 relating to gamepad input. and then uh, I think Palak will be talking about uh, some issues in the low latency broadcast with fan out uh, as well and some potential solutions. So to remind you all about what we're talking about, the uh, section 3.2 has two parts, one of which was about game streaming. So this is the, the game streaming use case. Um, and then there is a section 3.2.2, which is about low latency broadcast with fan out. The idea here is we have a low latency broadcast. We'll talk about what the meaning of that, what the word low latency means. And then we have some kind of caching or fan out system that's operating um, as well. So these are the two use cases, and we're trying to figure out exactly what the requirements are. Um, and so we have a bunch of issues and potentially PRs to address the issues. And so we'll go over these. The issues are 94 and 103. And then we have a whole bunch of PRs we'll talk about to, to try to address all, all of these issues. That's 
that's on the agenda for this portion. So issue 94 was about improvements for gamepad input. Um, and it was mentioned, I forget what meeting, but that there were issues with game pads. And so uh, one of the things to resolve this is try to figure out, hey, what are these issues? And also, what can the WebRTC working group in particular do about the issues? So I went over the gamepad spec, and there actually are uh, was an issue and a PR relating to events. So the idea is that gamepad would fire events instead of using a passive model. That was filed in issue four relating to the gamepad API. And there's a PR 152 to add game put input events. This is all in the gamepad, I guess, the gamepad working group. Uh, has nothing to do with whatever to see. But uh, kind of looking at this PR 152, it did have, uh, it does have a page on Chrome status. Uh, called Gamepad Button and Access Events. There's some documentation which was published in August uh, 2021. And there's a Chromium tracking issue, uh, but it doesn't look like it shipped because the last entry was August 20th, 2021. So I had some questions. I'm hoping some of you understand or know about this. Um, one question is, is the implementation of this Gamepad event thing stalled? Is there any chance of revival? And also, I'm trying to figure out, what does this have to do with the WebRTC working group? Like, is there anything the WebRTC working group can do to improve gamepad input, or is it just this uh, PR, which has nothing to do with us? And is there any reason that we would add a requirement to section 3.2.1 relating to gamepad, um, or some other editorial change? Or should we just close the issue? So I'd like to have a little bit of discussion on that. Does anybody have an opinion? Anybody know anything about this? Uh, is there anyone in the queue? Uh, I see none. Okay. Oh, you asked. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, just to say, uh, I don't see any relationship uh, with WebRC Working Group in terms of use case, right? Uh, gamepad is something that can be used with uh, with WebRTC, but just like WebRTC can be used with, say, WebSocket, Fetch. Right, right, um, right. So I think that uh, it's good if we can convey as as a working group, maybe we have a position saying, hey, it's important uh, that it's fixed, but then it's up to the game by input uh, CG right. or working group to actually uh, do it. So that's, I guess, all we can do there. So are you suggesting that it's possible in the use and uh, extend the use case document to have links to other working groups that just to say, hey, this is related to it? Because um, currently we just kind of focus on why we working group. I'm just wondering if you're recommending a, a kind of change in the way we think about this. Not, not really. Uh, I would say we, we, keep, we keep it to the scope to WebRC working group. But since we are aware that it's important uh, we just convey this message uh, to to the real working group, and that's okay. So we send like an that's email. The only thing we can do. Just send an email to the gamepad people. Ask hey, what's going on. Okay, but no yeah. change to the document. Any other right. opinions? Okay, thank you, Yuan. Uh, we'll we'll take that as advice. All right. So then the other issue was issue one hundred three, which Yuan filed. Uh, and we'll be talking about this at two levels, one of which is there's specific questions you and asked about N37, N38, and N39. We'll talk about it specifically. But uh, UN also asked meta questions about the way the document handles things. Um, and we'll talk about those as well. Because um, one of the things that uh, is in this email is that uh, some uses are deployed and whether they qualify as NV. So one big question that came up, and Tim Patton asked this as well, is how do I distinguish the use cases that are doable, or if they are doable with with what APIs, versus use cases that aren't doable yet, um, that that Tim calls aspirational, uh, and it's not clear from the document uh, as it is. And then, so uh, you went also asks, it seems some of the requirements are met, but the great question is, how do you know reading this which ones are met, and if so, by what? Um, and then uh, UN asked a question about low latency and what it means. So 
we're going to try to talk about all of this feedback. Um, we'll get to the meta issues first because they relate to the whole structure of the document and, and what it's trying to convey. All right. So one question is, uh, the problem with some of these requirements is that you can't really tell from the requirement what would meet it and, and what is related to it. So uh, as a general principle, it seems to make sense that requirements should be specific and actionable. That is, you can somehow determine whether the requirement is met, um, and if so, by what. And uh, you should know, hey, I have an API proposal, and you should be able to determine whether that actually addresses the requirement. So the requirement has to be specific and, and actionable enough. So uh, one question which was raised is, you know, as an example, does a certain requirement require new APIs or not? And if so, uh, what APIs have been proposed that relate to it? Um, and one thing about this is, and we're going to have a discussion about this in a bit, is absolute performance requirements may not be actionable. So you say, I need to be able to handle 4K resolution, for example. Well, the question comes up is, hey, just have better hardware or just improve the software implementation efficiency. And what has this got to do with API changes? So that's one principle. But the second is you should know whether a requirement is met. And that's actually a requirement of the W3C process because, as an example, when we brought WebRTC PC to uh, recommendation, we had to show that we solved the use cases. So, uh, and right now the document doesn't really particularly do a good job of this. So, an example is uh, you went out a question about N38, and um, in my opinion, that's met by the jitter buffer target requirement, but there's nothing in the document that really says that explicitly. So, that's uh, interesting. And then uh, if it's not met by anything, um, is there at least an issue that you can look at? And then you can say, oh, this issue was resolved because we proposed an API. So you'd at least be able to track if the issue was resolved or not. And the end result of all this is you know, people are looking at use cases. They're not sure, is this something we're trying to do? Is it something we are able to do? Uh, you know, they, don't, they don't understand it. So an example is, uh, and we'll talk about this in a bit, that Henrik filed an issue on exposing decode errors and software fallback. And that's an example of an issue which is related potentially to a use case that we could track and say, hey, do we have a proposal for this? And eventually uh, there might be a PR and the PR might be merged and you could say, hey, this requirement is actually fulfilled and here's, here's why. And then the last question is, great, maybe, uh, maybe we get the PR, maybe it gets implemented, but is there a test? So, you know, people will ask a question, is this actually supported in any browser and does it really work? Um, and so you'd like to be able to trace this eventually to a test and look at a test result and say, ah, it works in this and that browser. Uh, so uh, another question that comes up is what is the relationship of a use case to issues? I mentioned, you know, that in some cases the issues will uh, the solution to a requirement. Right now, there aren't any links to issues, so we can't really do that. Um, and so we can't track the resolution. Another thing is the document doesn't link to API proposals, so you can't really tell whether the requirement's satisfied or not, or what proposal might satisfy it. Um, and so there's a question about should the use case link to the proposals that are related to it? Um, and then the question is the relationship to the explainers. Um, should explainers link back to the use cases that they're trying to satisfy? So I'd like to open up some discussion. Uh, does anyone want to comment on this and give their opinion on Harold? Yeah, I was. <clears throat> I reacted initially about the the question of whether you you could test for whether you use whether something is uh, satisfied when it's performance dependent. I mean, right, right. You can certainly test. You can certainly verify that there's no configuration that has been demonstrated to satisfy the requirements. So you can demonstrate failure. Right. And so we, but uh, we can demonstrate that some configuration satisfies the performance requirement. And uh, so, for instance, if we if we set a delay target of uh, half a second, and the best we can do is uh, five seconds, then obviously we have not satisfied it. But if uh, 
high-end PC is able to do 0.5 seconds and a, and a Android phone is able to able to do one second, then I would say that we still have satisfied the half second. We have shown that it's possible. So you shouldn't be able to do everything on anything, but you should be able to at least demonstrate that it's possible to implement the use case. If, but uh, when it comes to linking, uh, I think that uh, link having uh, API proposals linked to use cases is a good thing. Okay. But uh, linking in the other direction is uh, seems questionable because. Uh, we might keep a database of links, but uh, uh, rewriting the use case every time we have a proposal to solve it. Right, right. right. Is the wrong solution. So, what do you think about the issues thing? Should the use cases link to issues? No, I would have these issues also linked to use cases. Issues linked to the use cases. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Harold. Anyone else? Okay, Yanni Bar. Any bar? Sorry, I'm unmuted now. Uh, yeah, so, so I, I agree with Harold. I think use cases, in my mind, is more of an input to the process than an output. So I like the idea of links going uh, to the use cases uh, and not going out of the use cases. <clears throat> um, we also had some other good general questions of how to uh, deal with use cases that I don't have a good answer for, but I wanted to uh, pick on the terminology of streaming because that's a little confusing so i might as well mention it now like in my mind anyway low latency streaming uh, and people correct me if they have a different opinion uh in my mind i interpret low latency streaming to actually mean high latency web rtc <laughs> in that in that uh, streaming in a general term is uh, you know web rtc is based for real-time conversation back and forth whereas streaming traditionally i think of uh, you know, a content uh, creator is broadcasting a stream that has much more higher delay and that low latency. To, so to a streamer, low latency. So to a streamer, WebRTC would be ultra low latency. So that's the first So we're going to get into that in a minute, Yanni Ver. That's okay. a whole other set of problems. But we're just, right now, we're just trying to focus on the meta issues that UN brought up. Right. And like what and also, we to fix the documents yes. to, to answer these questions. Sure. So that, that was my one part. The other part was the term streaming. We'd also like to clarify, I think, because uh, yeah. use cases are often using data channels, but also jitterbuffer target is a feature of Audio Video Center. Right. So we're okay. gonna we're gonna get to that in a bit because uh, that's also confusing and makes the the requirements not actionable because you don't know what they mean, <laughs> which is also not great. Yeah. All right. So uh, so thank you for the feedback on those meta questions. I think that will be helpful. Um, so then, so then Tim asked, uh, did this slide and said, "Hey, what do we do with the aspirations?" That stuff, I guess, that has no uh, has requirements, but maybe no proposals. Uh, so it's not something you can do. And uh, that would be like a hope and a dream. And uh, he asked whether they're out of scope. And in my opinion, at least, they're not out of scope. There's some there can be use cases that you actually can't do at the moment that we aspire to do. I don't know if anyone has an opinion about that. Uh, I guess part of the problem is it, he's not, we're going through the document, it's not always clear what's an aspiration and what's something that either you can do or, or partially do. That's part of the issue, I think. Uh, anybody have an opinion on this? Do we need to differentiate aspirations from things that we can actually do or maybe partly do? Anybody on the UN? Yeah, I think uh, use cases for this working group are use cases the working group will commit to solving. So I think it's very important to to not include uh, things unless we plan to actually solve them. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, uh, to get into the document, we have to care about solving them, but it, it could be stuff that you can't do, right? It could be, I mean, as long as people feel they want to solve it, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. what it's close to being solved or far away from being solved, I mm. guess. 
But I think for use case to have a consensus, it has to have a meaning that, that this is something that, you know, if we wait a couple of years, there'll be an API for it. In my opinion. Uh, UN? Yeah, with the, uh, I'm aligned with Univar there. I, I think first, uh, for Dream to be in NV, you need to have requirements that are actionable. And right. uh, uh, if they're actionable and we have a rough idea of APIs, then uh, we are not far from uh, a proposal, so that's good. But if if it's not actionable, if it's really hard to think of any good solution, uh, even in, in uh, midterm, then uh, I'm not sure it's worth uh, having it in the document. So that's why I like there. Like uh, maybe uh, dreams, dreams that, that can become reality and dreams that cannot become reality. And uh, I'm only interested in the first one. Okay. So yeah, as long as you can, you can take the dream and make it actionable and break it down, you're okay with it. But that it, it, it can't be just, it's, I guess it's a difference between a dream and a fantasy. <laughs> well, I guess hopes and dreams can have consensus, right? Right, right. Harold? Yeah, I would. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I'm arguing the opposite or not, but uh, when we try to do things that we haven't done before, failure is always an option. Right, right. I mean, uh, we, I, would, I would kind of agree that uh, we, should, uh, we shouldn't put things in a document where if we seriously think that there's no hope of reaching them, but... Uh, I don't want use cases to be uh, something that we can only touch if we have a complete proposal to, so to solve them now. So uh, I would say that, uh, that uh, aspirations need to be there, but uh, fantasies should not be. But finding the, the dividing line is hard. OK, thank you. All right, so now we're going to get into the specific specific proposals uh, that we have to try to address issue 103, which you filed. So uh, and other other things that we talked about. So this is PR 116. Um, last meeting we talked about uh, that we had this requirement in 22 that talked specifically about media manipulation using a GPU. And we talk about how there's lots of other ways to do efficient media manipulation. Maybe in, you could have an MPU, you could do WASM SIMD. Uh, so why was this focused on just the GPU? So our proposal is just to eliminate the uh, specific reference to the GPU and say it must be possible to do efficient media manipulation in worker threats. Any opinions? Harold, Harold, thumbs up, UN thumbs up. Okay. That seems like people think this is a useful change. All right, so that's PR 116. The next one is PR 117. And this was about requirement N37. And it says, uh, must be possible for the user's agent receive pipeline to process video at high resolution and framing. And UN pointed out it, it's not really particularly actionable. Like what? Okay, great. Like what's what do we need? How do you know what APIs actually relate to this? So, um, what what we we so we've modified it to to really focus in on one thing at least that could actually help this happen, which is to actually have better support for hardware acceleration, particularly hardware decode, because this is about in the streaming area. Um, and so we ask for the application to determine whether hardcore, hardware decode is supported. Uh, in my opinion, that would be solved by media capabilities, which is already there. But you also want to know, uh, be able to receive events to determine if after you, uh, whether hardware decode failed for some reason uh, and you had a failover to software. So this relates to Henrik's issue 146. Uh, which is exposing the decode errors and software fallback as an event. So that's our proposal is to replace N37 um, with the new text. And, uh, I, you know, there was a question about whether it made sense to link to Henrik's issue. I guess the answer is no. 
from what feedback we've heard and maybe the issue links to the use case, but okay, that's the proposal on PR117. Okay, uh, in the queue we have Yanni Bar. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if I like this change because it seems like whether you have hardware decode or not is a means to an end. Uh, so it sounds like uh, the earlier one was actually more aimed at uh, making sure that we had received pipelines that didn't have excessive copies and stuff like that. And the new requirement okay. seems quite different. So I'm not. Yeah, so UN's question was, different requirements. Yeah, the problem with the copy requirement is that it really didn't relate to this working group. So, for example, there has been lots of work on copying uh, in web codecs, for example, the color color conversions, you know, uh, being able to go from a video frame to a web GPU external texture, but none of that has anything to do with us. And, you know, so in WebRTC, I mean, you, I guess you could talk about the efficiency of uh, transversal streams versus transversal media stream tracks or something, but it, it didn't seem actionable in this working group. And then there was a question of, what do you mean by high resolution? How would you determine whether it was satisfied? So those are some of the problems with the existing requirement. Right, but maybe there are two issues here. One is the removal of uh, one requirement, and the other is an addition of another requirement. Right. Because it seems it's not clear to me that in order to process, in order for a user agent to receive and process video at high resolution frame rate, it's not obvious to me that the application needs to be able to determine whether a hardware decode is. Uh, on or off. It sounds like the user agent, and at least in many cases, will be able to satisfy the performance requirement without exposing potentially fingerprinting information to the application. Well, what what I've been hearing, at least from the gaming people, is that for some of the new stuff they want to do, like 4K and the higher frame rates, and and Sun will be talking more about this, that you actually really do need hardware acceleration. Um, that it can't be that it can't be done. For sure. Yeah. For sure, but the uh, user agent is able to to uh, satisfy hardware requirements uh, or to use uh, hardware, right? So I, I think what we should note for this control. one is we probably need more reviews of this PR to to talk about uh, figure out what exactly it should say. Um, so this one, I think we'll move on to the next one. But uh, please, uh, people want to look at this, please review it and give us your ideas of what you, you think should be. Okay, so. Uh, Next one is PR PR120. So uh, this relates to the streaming with fan out use case. And um, this one was confusing, uh, and we'll talk more about all the confusion that's in it. It's quite a bit of confusion. Because really, it, it's two distinct things in there. There are, and I think Yanni Bar just talked about this. There's a low latency case, and then there's the ultra low latency case, and they're actually slightly different. So a low latency example, and we'll talk about this more, would be something like a webinar where really, unless someone's asking a question, you don't really need to have ultra low latency. It's not interactive. Um, and in this use case has been implemented using the data channel on main thread. The problem with that is that, um, encountered a lot of latency jank on the main thread. So the solution to that uh, was support for data channel and workers um, and support for partial reliability. So don't just send all the messages, you know, ordered reliable, uh, do partial reliability or potentially even unreliable unordered and do your own forward error correction or something like that. So we're proposing to add requirements N13 and N16 to this use case for the case of the low latency uh, uh, scenario using data channel. These requirements are already there, so it's not anything new, but um, hopefully that will clarify one of UN's questions about what exactly we're talking about um, and whether uh, whether the support is there. So an example of this would be um, the combination of data channel and workers, for example, and the new managed uh, media source APIs, which also support workers. That would be a solution for this particular portion of it. Any comments? Any bar? Um, yeah, I uh, was a little surprised to find that it mentioned service workers because I don't think we have a proposal for that uh, at the moment. There's uh, there's uh, workers, there's shared workers, and then service workers. 
right? We do not have a proposal for that. Uh, N13, I, I'm using the same requirement as was in a, another use case that did require service workers. So I don't yeah. think service workers are required for this, but I just copied the same use case, uh, same requirement. So yeah, it's existing language. Yeah. Uh, Harold. It's Okay, I'm, I'm a little confused about this one because uh, it uh, presupposes that the only possible solution is data channels. And well, that's, being... a, that's another problem with it that UN pointed out, which I'll get to in the next slide. But yeah, it's, it was confused. It wasn't clear what the solution was, but that's also a problem. Yeah. Uh, and what, what, what it was a solution to it. Exactly. Uh, uh, that, that's the next slide tries to address that particular problem as well. Uh, the problem here, Harold, is it's mixing actually two things. Tim pointed this out in the review of the PR. It's mixing low latency use cases with ultra low latency use cases, which actually probably can't be solved with the data channel solution because it's too high latency and the congestion control. But we'll talk about that in a minute. And also adding arbitrary data in N16 means that uh, you can't make a solution for this on top of RTP, or not easily. Right, so yeah, as we'll talk about in the next slide, we try. We probably need to separate out these two sub-use cases, one is the ultra and one is the low, and they're different. But well, I'll get to that in a second. Um, Yuen? Yeah, to, to come back to the point of uh, service workers, so in WebRTC extensions, data channels are exposed in a uh, web ideal worker which, which means a dedicated worker shared worker and service worker so n13 is is already supported by web extensions yeah yes that's true yeah thanks and i i believe n16 is also supported isn't that right i think so as well yeah yeah so these are so so let me get to harold's question uh which is uh in the next slide all right, so there's a bigger, the bigger confusion here in section 322, which is, uh, so UN asked to clarify the meaning of low latency. And so Tim pointed out that there's actually two fairly distinct uses. There's uses like a webinar or a company meeting where there's, um, which would be more of a low latency, which means less than a second. And if you want to do that, that could be, that could use data channel for fan out and would require N13 and N16 to, to get rid of extreme jank and, and handle that. But if you're trying to do something like auctions or betting, your latency requirement is going to be a lot less. It's going to be less than 500 milliseconds. And that's very popular for WebRTC, like Harold pointed out, like you use RTP for that scenario. And if that's what you're doing, the data channel fan out probably is not going to work even with N13 and N16. So we have requirement N39, which covers RTP fan out. And then uh, Pollock is going to talk about N43 uh, for that. So I think that the problem here is we're, we've got this, this use case in 322, which is really two fairly distinct things with different architectures. And that is very confusing as well. Um, you have a comment, Harold? So I guess what we're proposing to do is add N13 and N16, Palak is proposing N43, and we have N39 covering the RTP fan out. And uh, yeah, UN? So, so it seems that since it's mixing two different use cases, uh, the solution would, should be to split. Uh, yeah, that would the, probably the be better. Into. Yeah, that would be, because the problem is you'd have this mishmash of requirements and you wouldn't be able to tell what was for what. So that's, that's a good suggestion, UN, is split three to two into the low and the ultra low. And so the ultra low would get requirement 39 and 43 potentially, and the low one would be N13 and 16. And, and uh, does that make sense, Harold? Well, not really. I not mean, really. Okay. If, we, if we have a solution that works well below 500 milliseconds, uh, mandating that you need to we, that we need to work on a separate solution that is uh, that that this uh, has a lower performance seems a bit bizarre well that there is a big difference harold which is that the one with the lower performance supports drm whereas supports DR, what? drm oh so then then the then uh, 
But the RM is a, is a separate requirement. Right, which is also not in there. So that's another yet another point of confusion. Yeah, so yeah. the low latency one would be able to support DRM, the ultra would not. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we'll we'll come back uh, next time and try to sort this all out. Okay, so we still <laughs> we still still have one a couple more slides here. All right. Uh, okay. So uh, we'll put off discussion of the PR and, and work through it again. Um, so now we have PR 119, and this relates to the user, user prompts. So there's two rationales for this. In game gaming, if the game doesn't involve chat between the users, there's no audio and video chatting, it's a little bit uh, astonishing to be asked to give permission for your microphone and camera. Like, why? What do you, what do you need, need this for? And then in the conventional streaming, you know, if you're watching a movie, for example, today, you know, on your favorite streaming service, you don't get a, a permission prompt for a microphone and camera, right? And and if you did, you'd probably go looking through your mobile device settings and try to figure out why this, what what it what this app required and why it needed your microphone and camera, and maybe take <laughs> remove the permissions. So why is this different with low latency streaming? You know. Um, it might make sense, for example, in a webinar, if you're asking a question or maybe a conference or something, I want to go to the mic, and then you could be asked for the permission. But if you're just sitting there watching your CEO or something in a company meeting, uh, to get that permission prompt is, is fairly astonishing. Uh, uh, Annie Bar, uh, is that, oh, UN, you're in the queue. Yeah, I'm wondering whether it's related to um, to I saying, "Hey, you can if leave you have a phone for camera, then you can use, you can iterate all interfaces, and you can pick the route that is the fastest one." And then for game gaming, it might be useful, but for low latency, it might it might not. Um, if if it's that that we're targeting, then uh, it, it would be good to make it m much clearer because as it is, N thirty six. Is already uh, is already good. You, I, I can send data, media data, or I can receive media data without uh, any prompt, and it's working today in all browsers. So it's not new. Uh, it's not something that it's it's already actionable. So sure, but it's yeah, but I mean improving. that would be it's, it's not helping us improve the situation. Yeah, so when you say it's actionable, it'd be actionable for conventional streaming, we already can do it. The question is, for these low latency things using WebRTC, do we suddenly, you know, have these requirements which which make no sense within the context of streaming? It's just, you know, it's still a streaming app, it's just lower latency, and how do you get into this weird world where you need a microphone and camera? Uh, Any more? So, so it, 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 yeah, yeah just, uh, it's a point. It's a point that uh, if there's camera and microphone, like uh, maybe a process will be a higher priority, and it's not. Or is it the, so? Is or is it the case that uh, in faces ne networking is not as good when there's no camera and microphone? These are the questions uh, I'd like to understand because there in, in in the requirement it's not clear at all to me what we are trying to ah, okay. to get to. Yeah, Phil. Oh, sorry, I think. Uh, okay, you were. Yeah. Yeah, okay. uh, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, I don't think it's appropriate to have a requirement that user agents are forbidden from adding prompts. I don't think that is much. Uh, for instance, if you were to view a movie in Firefox, you might see a prompt that "Do you wish to download uh, view DRM content?" So we would already be in violation of that. So I think user agents would have should be allowed to do whatever they feel is best for their user. So that's one. But I also sympathize with the idea, if this is, is about RFC uh, 8828 and ICE, uh, I totally agree that microphone tying that to microphone permission is, uh, or a camera permission, is, is kind of a poor solution. So I, I welcome explorations of maybe adding different types of prompts or different ways to solve that problem, particular problem, if that's what it is. But it, I don't know if that's, uh, as a requirement, I don't think we can say that no browser prompts is the requirement. Yeah, we're not saying no prompts. We're just saying a prompt for a camera and microphone where it's not obvious why you would need that. That's. Hippo? 
Yes, we also added the requirement or the gating of several statistics to get user media access. So, for example, right. decoder implementation, which might be one of the things that this PR considers. Um, so I'm trying to figure out what's the next step on this one. Uh, maybe more review um, on PR119. Well, I think I'd be okay with it if we change the wording to be less about the prompt, but uh, that it's tied to camera microphone permission. Seems. Okay. Well, why don't you uh, review it and make that comment okay. in, the, in the PR, and then we can figure out if we can uh, merge it. All right. All right. Thanks. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to turn this over to Sun who's going to talk about a whole bunch of other things that might be related to uh, game streaming. So, Sun? Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, this, this uh, slide for the rationale for the next slide. So I will quickly cover the, some of the characteristics of the cloud gaming, and then we'll jump over the next slide. So the basically, the cloud gaming is very similar to the general uh, Web RTC application, but we would like to highlight that the, there is a more continuous visual feedback to the user input, and with, with respect to the latency, uh, we just discussed about uh, glass to glass latency. But for the cloud gaming, you would like to prefer to have a click to pixel latency, and that latency level should be uh, much more smaller than. Uh, the general application. Also, another thing we would like to highlight it is to continuous to have a continuous uh, decode, decoding capability instead of uh, video freezing. Also, the last part is we want to have a consistent uh, latency for the uh, game playing uh, adaptability. It is much better to have a more consistent latency than any other um, use cases. So the combination of high complexity, ultra low latency, and faster recovery might be a good uh, uh, use case for the cloud gaming. And the next slide. So there are two, uh, four uh, requirements. I think we can uh, categorize as two. The first two is about uh, faster recovery and continuous decoding. And the last two is having a consistent uh, latency. So we can uh, group up this uh, requirement, but uh, we are not quite sure whether th this is uh, good to merge or just make it uh, separate items. So I hope uh, these uh, items could be reviewed by the uh, uh, PR so I, I'm not quite sure whether I can cover every item at this meeting. Uh, how do you think, uh, Bernard? Well, we can, we can ask for review, but I would, um, yeah, uh, uh, we can also have discussion here. OK. And answer questions from people. But we're almost out of time, but maybe a minute or two would be fine. OK. OK. So. Um, the first item is recovery using non uh, non keyframe, and this is might be useful in case of uh, very bad network condition. If we don't have a iframe, then the application should wait for the iframe. But this is not uh, very uh, solvable in a bad network condition. So we would like to have an option to recover the stream of we using the non iframe. frame the second item is uh, loss of encoder and decoder synchronous notification so sometimes the uh, current uh, decoding is depends on the previous frame but when the previous frame got lost uh, there should be a notification uh, for the decoder to re uh, map the previous uh, frame so that we can uh, recover the stream fastly. And the third one is for having a more configuration on the transmission uh, interval of RTCP uh, transport feedback message so that we can have more adaptive uh, latency 
And the last one is to cover the GitHub upper control to consider the uh, client user agent uh, capability. For example, the rendering pipeline and the CPU uh, consumption. So we can estimate the uh, best uh, decoding or uh, decoding performance of the client. So those uh, four are we would like to propose at this time. Um, any comment from folks? Any of our... Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I like gaming, so I, I don't see uh, a particular problem with it. I had some question about uh, N49, uh, where these connections connection should generate signals uh, indicating something about the encoder. Is that, do you imagine that being receiver side or uh, sender side, since you also mentioned RTCP? Oh, yes, it's, uh, it's it can be both. Yeah. Um... I, I do have a question about this because RPSI, you know, is defined. It's not implemented in WebRTC, but there's nothing that prevents a browser from implementing RPSI. Um, is this just an implementation issue, like um, that Chrome or Firefox or whatever doesn't support RPSI, or is there something more fundamental that would be needed for 49? Oh, it's for implementation purposes. Okay, so so it's not necessarily a new API needed, but just support for RPSI and browsers, I guess, and web, live web or something. Yeah, that's right. And then similarly, the 48 looks like uh, one way to do this would be um, uh, uh, alternative reference frames. Mm -hmm. Yes, correct. Um, okay. Um, uh, but, uh, I guess we also have uh, UN. UN. Yeah, in, in general, if uh, if we know that some of the things work in native applications and they do not work in the browser, uh, then uh, adding requirements like like this is good, and they, they seem like actionable, so that that's good. Um, I, I wonder. I'm not. I'm wonder whether, for instance, N fifty one is already we already good there, or whether it's uh, it's not good. But we can uh, discuss that at uh, review time. For N50, we have a variant of transport wide TCP feedback that should satisfy that requirement already. So I would say it's an implementation issue, not a spec issue. Unless you're aiming for an API to configure the interval. Bhavani? I just want to make a comment on uh, 48. Um, that would probably be two levels, or uh, in this group, we'd be interested in two levels of it. That one, we're saying you just recover using non keyframes, which means that it could result in corruption. So some applications may be able to tolerate it, and some applications may not be. Uh, the one that Bernard uh, mentioned that you can use alternate reference frames which uh, that wouldn't result in corruption. And that would be an example of a recovery without corruption. Uh, whereas the, I think N48 is meant to cover beyond um, beyond mechanisms that recover without corruption. So there we might want two levels of configurability. Um, so I think we're out of time for this segment, but what I would like to recommend for PR118 is continued discussion in GitHub. And I think we might want to give this more time at a, at a future meeting to really get into all of the, uh, not just the, the API issues, but all of the lower level um, RTP functionality that would be needed to do this. Because I think it, there's a lot of questions about, um, at least in my mind, about whether LiveWeb RTC has all the underlying uh, functionality that would be needed for this stuff. I don't think it does at the moment. Uh, like so, uh, just ch channeling Ecker on the, on this one. Where's the di where's the dividing line bet between ITF spec and WGD spec on this on this set of issues? Yeah, that's I think the question we need to answer. Uh, I mean, some of the stuff is in ITF. Like we have slice loss, we have RPSI. They're not implemented typically for new codecs anymore, um, and that's an issue. Like, 
we don't like in AB1, we didn't bother to specify how that even worked. Um, so that's kind of a question about whether we made a mistake doing that, not putting it into the new stuff. But um, yeah, that's a good. That's a good question, Harold. Is there a need for new feedback, or is he is are we just asking to implement the existing feedback? In some cases, that would require the codec bodies, right? You'd have to go to AL Media if you wanted this in AB1. Left it out. Okay. Anyway, so thank you. We're, we're going to move on to the next uh, segment and come back to this uh, next time. Thank you very much, Sam. All right, Pollock, set metadata. Yes. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Pollock. And today, I want to talk about adding the function set metadata for encoded frames to support redundant relay PCs. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so I want to start by discussing the existing use case, low latency broadcast with fan which we have already discussed earlier in the meeting today. And I want to specifically talk about uh, using P2P relays for large scale streaming applications. And so I want to take a look at an example scenario for next slide. Uh, so in this example meeting, uh, you have multiple participants who are sending their encoded video streams to multiple SFUs of servers, which themselves are sending these video to a P2P network. Now, this P2P network that we have here is more like a is a tree such that each receiving peer is only getting uh, is only getting frames from another peer. Um, now we know that peers are unreliable and can leave at any time, which makes all the other peers depending on these peers uh a bit yeah so they so all the other peers that are depending on this peer they also become less reliable they will not they it will cause disruption for them um so these other peers will now have to renegotiate new peer connections and which will end up causing a significant delay for them as well uh, next slide so how can we solve this so by that, I think for this, we can just add a uh, redundant peer communication channels for peers so that they have less lines so that instead of just depending on one peer, they can depend on multiple. Next slide. And this is how adding redundant PCs to your peer network would look like. So let's take the peers A, B, and C. And uh, in this case, uh, peer C is receiving streams, receiving video frames from both A and B. And let's say A is it's let's say C is only using the frames from A at the moment for decoding or for relaying. Now let's say A dies or it fails or it just leaves. Then that case we want to seamlessly switch to B to do the same things. Uh, however, we need to understand that though they might though we might be sending the same encoded frame payload, it might not have the same metadata because of the different network paths that these encoded frames might have taken, which means that you cannot easily switch from A to B, uh, and that will again cause a disruption for C, causing uh, delays. Next slide. And so to fix this, we propose updating the metadata of frames coming from A and B so that to C it appears, so that C can interchange between uh, these two encoded frames. Next slide. And this is how the design will look like for a receiving peer. So in this case, uh, so here you have two receiving peer connections, both of which are getting the same encoded frame payload, which is captured, uh, which, uh, which it gets in the same original capture, but have different metadata because of the different network paths that they've taken. And what we do here is we'll take encoded transforms, encoded transform to basically read encoded frames from these two receiving pair connections and then encode transform and then with the new function of set metadata we can change the timestamp and other things on these encoded basically the metadata on these encoded frames so that it becomes these two receivers frames become interchangeable for uh, this receiving pure the javascript can also take care of disposing of the duplicate in this case and then can pass this a uh, process stream for either forwarding to another peer or for just local rendering. Next slide. And this is how the JavaScript code will look like. You have two receiving peers from which you extract the readers and pass it to the function transfer frames. 
We also have a relay PC uh, from which we get the writer to write the frames, to, to write the process frames into. We can, uh, call this a relay PC writer. Uh, so the function transfer frames, it reads the frame from these two receiving PC uh, readers and basically sets the met metadata such that two encoded frames with the same payload have the same metadata. And here, after this process frame can then be written to the relay PC writer if it has not already been done for the same for the encoded frame with a similar payload. Next slide. And to support this use case, we propose adding a new requirement uh, of N43, which uh, to section 3.2.2. So N43 is already in the list of requirements, but it's not a requirement for the section yet. And that is what we propose to allow modification of metadata for encoded frames. Next slide. And this is, and we also propose two API changes. We propose modifying the timestamp for the RTC encoded video frame and also changing and also adding the function set metadata. We are more focused on just changing the frame ID and dependency of the metadata and nothing else because that is what will change in the server or SPU. Next slide. And we want to do the similar thing for audio frame, uh, but we just want to change the timestamp in that case. We don't want to change the metadata because audio frames do not have frame IDs or dependencies. So there is no need for that. Yeah. That would be it. Questions? Uh, Peter? So one of the fields on the metadata is the SSRC. Um, setting the metadata, would that mean that the application can set the SSRC of the outgoing RTP packet? Um, we don't, I don't think we want that. So we can just disallow the spec to change the SSRC. We mostly want to change just the frame ID and dependencies. Okay, so we'd have to specify exactly which fields in the encoded video frame metadata can be changed and can't be. Yeah. Okay. Any question? You win. Um, so the first question is, uh, it seems that you're mostly interested in the receiving side, not in the sending side, but the set metadata will apply to both. So I wonder whether you you thought about this. And the second uh, um, thing I'd like to say is that uh, in the current model of WebRTC and Godit transform, uh, it's a transform. So you can only write a frame uh, that was given from the reader that, it, that is uh, related to the writer. And in your example, you're taking a frame from a reader and sending it to another uh, writer, which are not connected. It's not the same receiver. So it's not allowed in the spec currently. So that's that would be a uh, a change that we should discuss first. Uh, that's my understanding there. And uh, when when we discussed that in in the past, uh, one point that was made was that in general, what you're trying to do there can be done with a web codec. So you you, you get the frames from uh, and code it transform. You get the data and then you use you use a decoder. And, and you do your rendering uh, on your own. So it, it seems what you're trying to get there is basically a digital buffer for free somehow, the reuse of digital buffer. And other proposals have been uh, thought but not yet uh, concretized where uh, there would be like a digital buffer API. And then you, you could realize what, you're, what, what you want to do with uh, digital buffer APIs plus web codec plus uh, canvas. But we won't be able to use that for relaying the frames if this peer also wants to relay the frames to the next peer. They can only be used for rendering, I guess, but not for relaying. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how you do uh, relaying there, actually. Um, because, uh, for instance, if, that, if bandwidth is is uh, is not good enough. For instance, this kind of thing. How how do you 
do the, uh, the these things. So we we, we the um, initial um, the, the constraint that you cannot enqueue uh, a frame in the writer that was not banded by the corresponding reader uh, is uh, a, a restriction currently that allows to not think about these issues. Uh, we know that it's working if the transform is not like increasing by to the size. And uh, so that's why I think the preliminary, preliminary question would be, uh, do we really want to enter that world? And you have a use case there that we should dig into. Uh, so that's what I would try to focus first. Okay. Um, I think around you know, the first question of sending and receiving, um, I think they're mostly concerned about receiving, but we can do the changes for sending set as well. But I guess right now in the spec, it doesn't differentiate between RT single frames do not differentiate between senders or receivers. Like they, they have the same interface. So it is fine, really. And yeah, I think if it is not allowed in the spec, so I guess that is the first thing. Yeah, but uh, I, I mean, I don't, uh, we have the restriction, but I don't see that there's any fundamental problem with allowing passing a, a frame from, from I mean, rather than call transform from one preconnection to the other. I mean, we might have a restriction, but we can we can just remove that restriction in the spec if, if there's no fundamental reason to, to have it. I think the fundamental no. reason was that uh, the, the use case, it, it, there was no use case for it. And it allowed to have a very simple model that we what we know was working. We do not we do not need to spend the time on investigating whether ex, ex, starting to expose that would cause some issues. And uh, we can certainly uh, think of uh, reviving this discussion. Uh, could we in, could we move on with a few, please? Yeah, Jan Ivar. Uh, yeah, so so I I second you on concern, and that the so I, I want to say I, I appreciate the use case, and I think that's something we should look at solving. I'm just not sure that the existing APIs uh, are the right uh, that that the the way it was accomplished here uh, seems to have uh, be problematic, and that the intended use for the API was to encode and decode a, a single stream. So I it seems a little weird here that you know when I when you do this fallback, I'm going to have uh, a receiver from one peer connection actually giving me data from another. It seems a little hacky, right? And it's like, how, what happens then that all these, and also if we want the behavior, we need to standardize it and specify it so that, uh, and there seems to be a lot of corner cases here that might be better to have a different shape surface that more directly addresses this. And the other part was, um, if we're going to touch a video frame, we have some comments, and this is more a pedantic comment that uh, we want to make sure we align with web codecs at some point, which also has um, audio encoded uh, video frames and metadata. But that's a detail. Uh, that's my comment. Thanks. Harold? Uh, yeah, about the uh, about, uh, restriction to one, to, to being within one PC. Uh, all the use cases we've been arguing about for the last year or more about uh, uh, about one-ended use cases require that you be able to take frames out of a P PC or insert them into a PC. So this is just uh, one particular use case that uh, th where that uh, restriction is inappropriate. So this is nothing new. And in order to support any of these use cases, we have to relax that transaction. So let's just do it. Well, I, I believe that uh, there was not consensus for the one-way media use cases. There was a call for consensus on that. So we might have to revisit that. No, no sorry, can, can you repeat that? The no consensus for which use case? The, we had a call for consensus uh, on one-way media use cases. Uh, this was back in February 7th. It was a summary of call for consensus on, on what might be the NV one way media use cases. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't gotten, we didn't get to that discussion today because we wanted to talk right. about the low latency ones first, which were early, even earlier. We had the CFC in January. So, right. So, just response to Harold uh, about I mentioned one way use cases. But, but yeah, anyway, Palak was proposing a change to 3 2, which was what we just talked about.
All right. Uh, so I guess uh, we have a PR for the change, uh, the requirements change, and people can comment on that. And uh, N43, as, as was said, was already in there. Uh, but um, this is kind of part of the RTP uh, forwarding or RTP uh, fan out portion of this. Uh, so we'll we'll continue to discuss that in GitHub with the with uh, Pollux PR. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to UN, who I think needs to be out of here soon. Talk about encoded transform. Yes. Thank you. And uh, next slide. So um, we, we talked with Bernard and, and others uh, about uh, back pressure. And uh, currently in uh, WebRT and Code Transform, back pressure is disabled. And uh, we, we got some feedback, but it was surprising. And the Web Transport Working Group also had feedback about, hey, back pressure, uh, should it be uh, used or, or not? So that's, that's the issue there. And the current, uh, in, in the spec currently, and I believe in all implementations, back pressure is disabled. So let's start with the pipeline. Uh, basically, you have an encoder. It's owned by the user agent. And then that's where you have a readable stream. You go to the transfer, writable stream. You go to the network. And then, bang, you are again a uh, user agent. You have the same uh, on the receiving side. So in, in typical case where everything would be done in JavaScript, and let's say you are doing like uh, video encoding uh, in Canvas, Canvas generate the frame, then you encode it, then you send it through WebSocket, for instance. You actually want to not buffer too much data. You do not want to uh, generate a lot of video frames uh, because otherwise memory will blow up. And that's where um, back pressure is shining because the network uh, will tell the transform that it might be uh, too slow, so the transform should uh, say, hey, okay, I need to say uh, my readable stream and then my video frame generator that, hey, you should slow down. And, and then we have a pipe that is optimized uh, in terms of memory and, uh, and in terms of throughput. So that, that, that's good for uh, this kind of uh, use cases. In our case, um, the network is lossy and we do not want to, to wait too much. Uh, so that's why we have a, a different model. Uh, but in any case, uh, next slide. So there, uh, the first thing to, to understand is whether it's important to say anything about back pressure. Uh, and we can note that back pressure is observable to the GF transform. Uh, for instance, if a writer is not ready, usually um, people doing transform, they will say, okay, I'm writing and I will await the write to do the next write, or I will await the writer to, to be ready to do the next write. And that's where back pressure is, ha is uh, computation is happening. Uh, the resolution of the write promise or the resolution of uh, the ready promise will be dependent uh, on uh, back pressure computation. So it, it's observable to, to JavaScript whether the US agent uh, will um, apply back pressure or not. And that's why we think it's important to, for consistency between browsers, uh, to be as specific as possible. And that's why, uh, since currently browsers are aligned and uh, we might not see a, a good use case for back pressure, uh, we prefer to say, okay, back pressure is disabled, it's consistent across browsers, and there's no surprise for uh, JavaScript uh, developers. So next slide. So, let, let's say now, um, if a transform is writing too much data, so data is, uh, there's too much data to go to the network. Um, that's where, in the case where we're using WebSocket, it's actually good for WebSocket to say, hey, please slow down, and then the transform can, can adapt. But in our case, uh, if a transform is writing too much data, uh, some things like packets will be dropped. Uh, either directly at the user agent level, maybe, or uh, in the pipeline. And then the user agent will be notified through a feedback mechanism that uh, it's outputting too much data. So at some point, uh, user agent will know that uh, too much data is sent and it should slow down, it should reduce the, uh, what is being sent. 
And for instance, one possibility is for the user agent to instruct encoder to reduce throughput. So, but in any case there, as you see, uh, the transform itself does not benefit from knowing that packets are dropped. Um, because the only thing it can do is slow down uh, writing data, but it's adding latency uh, without helping much uh, the user agent, which is the one that is uh, uh, controlling the encoder to uh, reduce the throughput. So in, in that case, since the user agent is knowing encoder and network, uh, and the user agent is in, is in a good position to apply some kind of adaptation without uh, using the back correction mechanism that is going through the transform. Uh, next slide. So uh, another case is uh, if the transform is too slow. Uh, so it's not writing enough data and then the readable stream is anchoring and the, the size of the queue is, uh, is getting bigger. So there you could say, hey, back pressure, it, it would be good because the encoder can, um, can maybe do something there. But there, it's not really visible to uh, the JavaScript transform, and the encoder can exactly know the size of the queue of the readable stream. So there's no need for stream back pressure, and uh, user agent can do what they want. Uh, they can reduce frame rate uh, by dropping frames by your encoder, for instance, and, and that's good. So again, in, in that case, there's no need for uh, back pressure, as I as I think. And so next and final slide. So my case, case takeaway, and uh, I'm, uh, we can certainly discuss that, is that in the context of WebRTC and Code Transform, back pressure is not needed because the user agent knows actually both ends of the transform. It basically knows uh, everything and, and um, allowing the transform to know that something is not really good is, is not helpful because the transform has uh, very few few ways to do anything to help the user agent, especially since it's in roughly context. And so, the good news is what what working with stream spec uh, acknowledges this with uh, using uh, plus infinity as a valid high watermark. And it's the way we should have used uh, things there. Uh, we have done a different way, which which is to say that a frame has a size of zero, which is equivalent. That is not uh, very helpful in terms of understanding and in terms of message. So the proposal here would be editorial in the sense that we would not change uh, what implementations and specs are doing, but we would update the specification to use plus infinity to align with uh, how we should do with uh, interact with the string spec and mention in the rationale uh, why we are using plus infinity as a design note and. Uh, noting the fact that it's a transform, the fact that it's a lossy context, and the fact that uh, we want to trade reliability for latency in the web of here and territory. Uh, thoughts? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I would think I was oh, in the group. No, no. Um, so I, I want to ask about the general <clears throat> principle here. So I think what you're saying is that, uh, you know, WebRTC uses RTP that's unreliable, so you don't want to build a queue. Um, I'm just trying to think of the implication for something like web transport, which has both unreliable modes, like data quick datagrams and reliable streams, and streams of streams, which can be partially reliable. And I guess what you're saying there is what, this would apply to the datagrams, because they're lossy, and maybe to the partially reliable stream of streams, but it might make sense to have uh, back pressure in the reliable streams in web transport. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, that, that seems like a, a good summary for, for web transport. Um, may, maybe there's a use case for web transport uh, since it's, it's a lower level. You, you, you do not control both ends. So maybe there's a use case for datagram for, uh, for back pressure. I, I'm not quite sure, frankly, uh, but uh, because even if you have difficulties sending uh, the packets to the network process that will actually send, send them through UDP, uh, you, you can drop them at any point, right. Uh, right. even the, within the user agent. Right. Uh, but if it's if it helpful to actually uh, allow the applic web application to know that that's what's happening, uh, networking is good, but for some reason, like CPU or whatever, some packets are dropped internally to the user agent, then maybe it could be useful, uh, but, but I, I don't know. 
Um, but the difference here is the web on web transport, the JavaScript application is responsible for a generation. Uh, and uh, for instance, what is the bitrate? What, what QP am I using for web codecs and so on? In, in WebRTC, uh, there's no way for the JavaScript application to actually uh, manage that currently. So maybe when it will, maybe if uh, the web application at some point is able to do this, then we could uh, uh, revisit this. But uh, until then, I don't think there's a, there's a need to for back pressure in WebRTC. Peter? I just wanted to say I agree with the conclusion. I think it's a good idea to disable back pressure in this case. Harold? Harold? Yeah, just uh, I think this actually provides a very good feedback on why our current uh, feedback model is uh, insufficient and should be replaced. And uh, I think the proposed solution is, uh, you can kind of clarify something for me. Mm -hmm. You're saying that if if you go with infinite as a high watermark, the transform will send the frames and the next step will either send them or discard them. Um, Are you saying that the same no, thing happens when you add zero? Um, zero and plus infinity are exactly the same. Uh, the only impact is when the right promise will resolve, and it will resolve in the next uh, micro task with zero or plus infinity. But that is not changing okay, so, anything. So, uh, with the current specification, will the will the right promise? Uh, when will the will the right promise uh, resolve? In the next micro task. So there, there's no change of behavior there it's yeah. just so somehow it's just editorial uh yeah. that's how i flagged it in, in the pr uh but um we we want to mention the rational and uh have a discussion there uh about uh, back pressure also so uh i think that uh, by leaving it in this state we we make a lot of applications, including all the one one and that ones I've been talking about for a year, impossible. And so, yeah. I would I, I could accept that this is an editorial change, and it's probably easier to read than than our current specification. So this seems okay, but we should really solve the basic problem and do explicit explicit feedback that the application can see. So I did a yeah, proposal I, for that uh, at IDF one fifteen, but uh, haven't been I, able I, to follow up on that. I I, I welcome um, ideas and feedback. Uh, I do not think that back pressure, like when the promise is resolved, is 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 enough. You need more than that. And, Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. We, we we can ex we can expose things uh, in this transformer, for instance, in various Swift, and uh, and that would be more beneficial. And if if we have good a good enough mechanism like that, then uh, whether we use back pressure at the end of the day, I, I, I don't know, for this one and these cases. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, Yuen. Um, so our last item is, well, actually not the last item, it's we're on to the ICE controller API, Samir. Hi, so uh, next slide, please, thank you. So today I'd like to talk about uh, how we can allow the application to change the selected candidate pair that's being used for transport. And uh, from the previous discussions, the main questions around this revolve around how can we do this in a manner that's compatible with uh, RFC 8445? And how would selecting a different candidate pair fit in with the entire I state machine? So let me try and address that. So traditionally, the way ICE nomination works is both the peers gather candidate pairs and exchange them. They start stem connectivity checks, and then the controlling agent at some point picks a candidate pair to uh, use as a selected uh, pair. It will redo a stem binding request with the use candidate attribute set. 
And if that stem transaction succeeds, then it becomes a nominated candidate pair and uh, becomes a selected pair. So the ICE RFC 8445, it's pretty strict with respect to nominations. So once a candidate pair has been nominated, the agent has to use that to send data. And changing that is not allowed. There has to be an ICE restart to change the nominated candidate pair. So that's a pretty strict requirement. Uh, in terms of what happens with the non-selected uh, candidate pairs, so uh, for some backward compatibility reason, uh, the agents can continue to respond to checks on that for a few minutes, but eventually the goal is to free those up. Uh, and then the controlling side is allowed to reject. Uh, there's really no reason why it couldn't do that. And in that case, uh, the candidate pair would uh, become failed and I would, uh, that data stream at least would uh, go to the failed state. So that's sort of uh, what exists today. Next slide. So uh, given the constraints and limitations of RFC 8445, how do we actually allow the application to change the selected pair? So the if we follow the strictest uh, boundaries then we can only do this with an i3 start once negotiation has actually happened uh, and that's an expensive process so in that case we would have to do an i3 start which means negotiation has to happen again uh, we can try and optimize this a bit by saying that we retain the candidates already gathered uh, maybe even just the uh, the candidates from the pair that the application has indicated. Uh, and then that the connectivity checks have to repeat again, and then uh, that pair can be nominated. So that's overall a pretty expensive process. Uh, now, over the years, there have been uh, various ICE extensions proposed uh, for this. So there's ICE renomination continuous nomination as well. And uh, some of these proposals are actually implemented in uh, various browsers to different extents. Uh, but I would like to talk about uh, one option which actually stays within the bounds of RFC 8445. And uh, shout out to Peter for the suggestion. Uh, so what we could do, what's allowed by RFC 8445, is we could actually separate selection of a candidate pair from the nomination process itself. Uh, and this is actually allowed. So uh, when the controlling agent actually picks the pair to nominate, that's left entirely up to the ICE agent. So that can be deferred as long as necessary. And until a pair has been nominated, data can actually be sent on any of the valid pairs that is any pair that actually succeeded connectivity checks uh, without nomination so that's entirely allowed and so that's uh, how i propose we uh, allow the application to set the selected candidate pair so the controlling side can simply uh, once checks have completed and once there are certain uh, valid pairs the controlling side can just start sending data on any of the valid pairs and the control side will follow suit, uh, follow suit and just uh, respond with data on the same candidate pair. And uh, stun checks are also allowed to be performed indefinitely to uh, make sure that uh, the agents are aware what pairs are still valid. There is an upper limit that's suggested in the spec, but it's not mandated. Uh, so there's an upper limit of 100. It's, again, not mandated. And there is a lower bound on how frequently checks can be sent. So there's some sort of rate limiting already been built into it. Uh, and then we've uh, already in the previous meetings talked about a cancelable event that's fired if the agent wants to remove a candidate pair. And so with that, applications can uh, keep uh, candidate pairs alive um, and available by um, uh, preventing default on this event. And then the final step that we need is to actually prevent nomination from happening itself, because once nomination happens, then we can't change to a different candidate pair. And so for that, I propose that uh, there's a cancelable event. So there's already a selected candidate pair change event in RTCI's transport. Uh, which could be made cancelable to prevent nomination. It doesn't maybe quite work because today this event is fired after the pair has already changed. 
uh, whereas we would want it to fire before uh, the candidate pair, the selected candidate pair changes uh, to allow the application to cancel that. So uh, that's the proposal. It I think stays uh, pretty uh, compatible with any future ICE extensions. So, for instance, uh, today the way this could be implemented is if the application allows the nomination to go through, then calling said selected candidate pair after that would result in an error. Whereas in the future, if an extension is implemented uh, and renomination is allowed, let's say, in that case, calling said selected candidate pair after a nomination just performs a renomination instead. Uh, now, the obvious side effect with this is that since nomination doesn't happen, uh, the I state never goes to complete. It goes to connector, and then it could go to failed or closed or any of the other states. And that's the one uh, change with this approach. Uh, and uh, RFC 8445 also does say that a pair has to be nominated at some point, but I think the main reason for that is to allow candidates to be freed up. And we've also proposed uh, an API to do that by uh, uh, essentially removing candidate pairs that we no longer need, which will allow candidate pairs to be freed up. So that uh, uh, concern should also be mitigated. So that's the proposal. Uh, I can uh, go over the details on GitHub, but I would really like to get some thoughts on the approach for this. So, yeah, questions. I think Peter's first in queue. Um, I, I obviously like the idea that I came up with with uh, selecting without renominating, but I, I don't think we need to suppress the nomination necessarily because I think. Uh, 8445 allows uh, changing the selected candidate pair even after nomination. The only downside is that the remote side, when it sees a nomination, might choose to um, remove its local candidates that aren't the nominated candidate pair. But I don't think that's a major downside. So I think we could simplify this proposal by not require not having the suppression of the nomination and just focusing on the uh, selecting, changing the selected candidate pair, even if nomination has happened. Mm. So uh, two parts to that. So one additional reason for suppressing nomination is if the ICE agent on its own decides to use a certain uh, candidate pair, then uh, instead of switching back and forth between different candidate pairs, the application can simply prevent that from happening and continue to use whatever candidate pair was in use or uh, call set selected on its own. Uh, and then with respect to the spec, I was looking specifically at one section, 12.1, uh, sending data, which said that the agent must send data on the selected pair itself, but uh, we, we, we can discuss offline if uh, exactly what the interpretation of that is, if uh, selecting a different pair is still somehow allowed. Okay, the, the, I just, one other comment I wanted to make is that um, the current behavior of uh, Chrome, LibWebRTC, Edge, and I'm guessing Safari already nominates more than once. So uh, this particular part of 8445, which we're trying to avoid um, violating, is already widely violated. So that's all. Right. So. Uh, yeah, I guess our only response to that would be this is sort of the broadest uh, uh, possible proposal, I guess, uh, that would avoid the most amount of violations, so to say. Harald? Yeah, just pointing out that uh, currently we don't go to, currently Chrome doesn't go to completed anyway, because it supports trick lies which adds candidates, and it does not support end of candidates. Right. So that's uh, something that, uh, yeah. 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 We never hit that part of RFC 8445. Mm. So this might be easier than you think. 
Great. Any more? Uh, yeah, so this sounds good, but uh, this is, I'm sort of wondering if this uh, should be addressed to the ITF uh rather than this working group uh whether this is okay or not um so um uh i mean uh, i think some of uh the people i'm thinking of at our company are on vacation so i could try to call them call out and have them comment on the issue to see if they think this is okay or not but i can't tell right but okay uh yeah so um I don't think I've updated the issue with this proposal. It's, uh, yeah, uh, uh, it was a pretty recent discussion with Peter, but I'll go and post an update on that. And then, yeah, more I'll definitely appreciate it. Thank you. Any other questions? Otherwise, we could continue the discussion over GitHub. All right, thank you. All right, so it looks like I'm next. Is that right, Bernard? I'm not hearing Bernard, so I'm just gonna go ahead. All right, yes, so um, I'm gonna talk about uh, permissions query, which is an API to uh, detect, uh, for applications to detect what permissions the user has given on a particular browser. And the context is, our motive here is that in Firefox, uh, we're just finishing up, uh, uh, tightening up enumerate devices to not leak so much information ahead of get user media, which is uh, what the spec wants. So in that process, we're running into some web compat issues where some video conferencing sites were looking at whether Firefox would expose device information or not to determine whether uh, it had permission or not. And that's because uh, Firefox for a long time has not supported permissions query for camera and microphone. So we're implementing that finally. Uh, with some caveats that I won't go into here. Um, you're happy to follow some of the links to discover those. But part of the spec uh, that uh, of, of the permissions integration spec, uh, uh, of the permissions integration section of our media capture main spec and output uh, is that uh, we're supposed to implement a device ID modifier to the permission descriptor. <clears throat> And the idea there was for JavaScript to be able to query permissions for individual media devices. Now, this is only useful on browsers that implement per device permissions, which is currently only Firefox. Uh, here at Mozilla, however, we're not planning to implement the device ID part because we have some fingerprinting concerns uh, that would extend beyond uh, other browsers. Also, there are currently no implementations of this part of the API, and that's only one. Uh, web platform test, which is a manual one for set sync ID. And as far as I know, there's no implementations planned. So uh, I guess uh, my first question is temperature of the room. Is anyone planning to implement this? And if not, I propose we remove this API. That is the device ID member of the permissions query dictionary. And from uh, specifically for camera and microphone, um, and then maybe later also for uh, uh, speaker selection. We had some internal discussion where for speaker selection, the story is a little different. Um, it has to do with, uh, so there might still be a use case there uh, that we might want to postpone removal for. And that's pretty much it. Um, I go into some details on the next slide. Uh, uh, you can do next slide now. Uh, thank you. Uh, so again, a fingerprinting surface, uh, you get a bit per device uh, on the user system, and it seems to defeat the mitigations we've taken in enumerate devices to non expose information ahead of get user media. And also the existing API seems sufficient uh, to negotiate consent for one camera and one microphone. Uh, the existing spec says, if a grant of permission is present on some but not all devices of a kind, query without a device ID will return granted. And conversely, if a denied permission is present on all devices of a kind, a query without device ID will return denied. So with this, this existing functionality, uh, we believe applications have uh, all they need uh, to obtain 
initial consent for a camera or microphone. And uh, Firefox, which is the only browser to maintain uh, per device permissions, only does so for temporal permissions or temporary permissions. So we don't actually persist them. So that uh, further reduces the need for this. And so Firefox will already return, would already prefer to return a granted device instead of prompting when possible. So for instance, if you ask for the default without specifying uh, constraints, uh, and you already have access to camera B, we will return camera B instead of camera A. So those are the arguments, no implementations. Uh, so uh, do we remove, deprecate, Marcus feature at risk? Discuss. So are there any objections to removing this API for media capture main to start? Harold? In the interest of making simpler specs, I'm in favor of removing it. Great, thanks. Any other comments? All right, that was shorter than I expected. Uh, so there are no objections to removing this API. Um, and I would like to add, uh, can we do a caveat of removing it for media, for camera and microphone to start? Uh, I wanna discuss it internally at Mozilla. If, uh, and we'll try, I guess we can aim for removal and we'll open an issue if we wanna keep it for speaker selection and try to argue that. Okay, thank you. All right, I think we've gotten to the end of our uh, slides and we're actually ahead of time. Wow. Um, do we have any wrap up and next steps, Harold, from your notes? So I saw one. Uh, they have consensus, consensus on removing the, by utilizing the GPU language. Slide 20. Most of the rest went to to continued discussion on GitHub, I believe. Mostly a lot of positive noises on quite a few things. Uh, but that was the only thing I had I noted the consensus on. And yes, there was consensus to to remove device ID and permission spray. Okay. All right. I think that's it for this. Uh, this meeting, um, we will not have an August meeting because people are typically on vacation. So the next meetings will be at PPAC and uh, I'll send an email to the list summarizing everything, but we have uh, a whole bunch of meetings during PPAC week, um, including a Weber to see meeting, a joint meeting with the media working group. So about at least, I think four hours worth of meetings during PPAC. So we'll, we'll see you then, uh, but it's not, too early to start thinking about TPAC and what you want to present there. Because go on vacation as soon as you come back, it will be TPAC. Thank you, everybody.